Book thirteen, chapters twelve through twenty one of the City of God. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Darren L. Slider, www.logoslibrary.org. The City of God by St. Augustine of Hippo. Book thirteen. Chapter twelve. When, therefore, it is asked what death it was with which God threatened our first parents if they should transgress the commandment they had received from him, and should fail to preserve their obedience, whether it was the death of soul, or of body, or of the whole man, or that which is called second death, we must answer, it is all. For the first consists of two, the second is the complete death which consists of all. For, as the whole earth consists of many lands, and the church universal of many churches, so death universal consists of all deaths. The first consists of two, one of the body and another of the soul. So that the first death is a death of the whole man, since the soul without God and without the body suffers punishment for a time. But the second is when the soul without God but with the body suffers punishment everlasting. When, therefore, God said to that first man whom he had placed in paradise, referring to the forbidden fruit, In the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die, that threatening included not only the first part of the first death, by which the soul is deprived of God, nor only the subsequent part of the first death, by which the body is deprived of the soul, nor only the whole first death itself, by which the soul is punished in separation from God and from the body, but it includes whatever of death there is, even to that final death which is called second, and to which none is subsequent. Chapter 13 For as soon as our first parents had transgressed the commandment, divine grace forsook them, and they were confounded at their own wickedness. And therefore they took fig-leaves, which were possibly the first that came to hand in their troubled state of mind, and covered their shame. For though their members remained the same, they had shame now where they had none before. They experienced a new motion of their flesh, which had become disobedient to them, in strict retribution of their own disobedience to God. For the soul, reveling in its own liberty, and scorning to serve God, was itself deprived of the command it had formerly maintained over the body. And because it had willfully deserted its superior lord, it no longer held its own inferior servant. Neither could it hold the flesh subject, as it would always have been able to do had it remained itself subject to God. Then began the flesh to lust against the spirit, in which strife we are born, deriving from the first transgression a seed of death, and bearing in our members, in an our vitiated nature, the contest, or even victory, of the flesh. CHAPTER fourteen. For God, the author of natures, not of vices, created man upright. But man, being of his own will corrupted, and justly condemned, begot corrupted and condemned children. For we all were in that one man, since we all were that one man, who fell into sin by the woman who was made from him before the sin. For not yet was the particular form created and distributed to us, in which we as individuals were to live, but already the seminal nature was there from which we were to be propagated. And this being vitiated by sin, and bound by the chain of death, and justly condemned, man could not be born of man in any other state. And thus, from the bad use of free will, there originated the whole train of evil, which, with its concatenation of miseries, convoys the human race from its depraved origin, as from a corrupt root, on to the destruction of the second death, which has no end, those only being accepted who are freed by the grace of God. CHAPTER fifteen. It may perhaps be supposed that because God said, Ye shall die the death, and not deaths, we should understand only that death which occurs when the soul is deserted by God, who is its life. For it was not deserted by God, and so deserted him, but deserted him, and so was deserted by him. For its own will was the originator of its evil, as God was the originator of its motions towards good, both in making it when it was not, and in remaking it when it had fallen and perished. 
But though we suppose that God meant only this death, and that the words, In the day ye eat of it, ye shall die the death, should be understood as meaning, In the day ye desert me in disobedience, I will desert you in justice, yet assuredly in this death the other deaths also were threatened, which are its inevitable consequence. For in the first stirring of the disobedient motion which was felt in the flesh of the disobedient soul, and which caused our first parents to cover their shame, one death indeed is experienced, that, namely, which occurs when God forsakes the soul. This was intimated by the words he uttered, when the man, stupefied by fear, had hid himself, Adam, where art thou? words which he used, not in ignorance of inquiry, but warning him to consider where he was, since God was not with him. But when the soul itself forsook the body, corrupted and decayed with age, the other death was experienced, of which God had spoken in pronouncing man's sentence, Earth thou art, and unto earth shalt thou return. And of these two deaths that first death of the whole man is composed. And this first death is finally followed by the second, unless man be freed by grace. For the body would not return to the earth from which it was made, save only by the death proper to itself, which occurs when it is forsaken of the soul its life. And therefore it is agreed among all Christians who truthfully hold the Catholic faith, that we are subject to the death of the body, not by the law of nature, by which God ordained no death for man, but by his righteous infliction on account of sin. For God, taking vengeance on sin, said to the man, in whom we all then were, Dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Chapter 16 But the philosophers against whom we are defending the city of God, that is, his church, seem to themselves to have good cause to deride us, because we say that the separation of the soul from the body is to be held as part of man's punishment. For they suppose that the blessedness of the soul then only is complete when it is quite denuded of the body, and returns to God a pure and simple and, as it were, naked soul. On this point, if I should find nothing in their own literature to refute this opinion, I should be forced laboriously to demonstrate that it is not the body, but the corruptibility of the body, which is a burden to the soul. Hence that sentence of Scripture we quoted in a foregoing book, For the corruptible body presseth down the soul. The word corruptible is added to show that the soul is burdened not by any body whatsoever, but by the body such as it has become in consequence of sin. And even though the word had not been added, we could understand nothing else. But when Plato most expressly declares that the gods who were made by the Supreme have immortal bodies, and when he introduces their Maker himself, promising them as a great boon that they should abide in their bodies eternally, and never by any death be loosed from them, why do these adversaries of ours, for the sake of troubling the Christian faith, feign to be ignorant of what they quite well know, and even prefer to contradict themselves rather than lose an opportunity of contradicting us? Here are Plato's words, as Cicero has translated them, in which he introduces the Supreme addressing the gods he had made, and saying, Ye who are sprung from a divine stock, consider of what works I am the parent and author. These, your bodies, are indestructible so long as I will it, although all that is composed can be destroyed. But it is wicked to dissolve what reason has compacted. But, seeing that ye have been born, ye cannot indeed be immortal and indestructible, yet ye shall by no means be destroyed, nor shall any fates consign you to death, and prove superior to my will, which is a stronger assurance of your perpetuity than those bodies to which ye were joined when ye were born. Plato, you see, says that the gods are both mortal by the connection of the body and soul, and yet are rendered immortal by the will and decree of their Maker. If, therefore, it is a punishment to the soul to be connected with any body whatever, why does God address them as if they were afraid of death, that is, of the separation of soul and body? Why does he seek to reassure them by promising them immortality, not in virtue of their nature, which is composite and not simple, but by virtue of his invincible will, whereby he can effect that neither things born die, nor things compounded be dissolved, but preserved eternally? Whether this opinion of Plato's about the stars is true or not is another question. 
for we cannot at once grant to him that these luminous bodies or globes which by day and night shine on the earth with the light of their bodily substance have also intellectual and blessed souls which animate each its own body as he confidently affirms of the universe itself as if it were one huge animal in which all other animals were contained but this as i said is another question which we have not undertaken to discuss at present this much only I deemed right to bring forward in opposition to those who so pride themselves on being, or on being called, Platonists, that they blush to be Christians, and who cannot brook to be called by a name which the common people also bear, lest they vulgarize the philosopher's coterie, which is proud in proportion to its exclusiveness. These men, seeking a weak point in the Christian doctrine, select for attack the eternity of the body, as if it were a contradiction to contend for the blessedness of the soul, and to wish it to be always resident in the body, bound, as it were, in a lamentable chain. And this, although Plato, their own founder and master, affirms that it was granted by the Supreme as a boon to the gods he had made, that they should not die, that is, should not be separated from the bodies with which he had connected them. Chapter 17. These same philosophers further contend that terrestrial bodies cannot be eternal, though they make no doubt that the whole earth, which is itself the central member of their god, not indeed of the greatest, but yet of a great god, that is, of this whole world, is eternal. Since then the Supreme made for them another god, that is, this world, superior to the other gods beneath him, and since they suppose that this god is an animal, having, as they affirm, a rational or intellectual soul enclosed in the huge mass of its body, and having, as the fitly situated and adjusted members of its body, the four elements, whose union they wish to be indissoluble and eternal, lest perchance this great god of theirs might some day perish, what reason is there that the earth, which is the central member and the body of a greater creature, should be eternal, and the bodies of other terrestrial creatures should not possibly be eternal, if God should so will it? But earth, they say, must return to earth out of which the terrestrial bodies of the animals have been taken. For this, they say, is the reason of the necessity of their death and dissolution, and this the manner of their restoration to the solid and eternal earth whence they came. But if any one says the same thing of fire, holding that the bodies which are derived from it to make celestial beings must be restored to the universal fire, does not the immortality which Plato represents these gods as receiving from the Supreme evanesce in the heat of this dispute? Or does this not happen with those celestials, because God, whose will, as Plato says, overpowers all powers, has willed it should not be so? What, then, hinders God from ordaining the same of terrestrial bodies? And since, indeed, Plato acknowledges that God can prevent things that are born from dying, and things that are joined from being sundered, and things that are composed from being dissolved, and can ordain that the souls once allotted to their bodies should never abandon them, but enjoy along with them immortality and everlasting bliss, why may he not also effect that terrestrial bodies die not? Is God powerless to do everything that is special to the Christian's creed, but powerful to effect everything the Platonists desire? The philosophers, forsooth, have been admitted to a knowledge of the divine purposes and power which has been denied to the prophets. The truth is that the Spirit of God taught his prophets so much of his will as he thought fit to reveal, but the philosophers, in their efforts to discover it, were deceived by human conjecture. But they should not have been so led astray, I will not say by their ignorance, but by their obstinacy, as to contradict themselves so frequently. For they maintain with all their vaunted might, that in order to the happiness of the soul it must abandon not only its earthly body, but every kind of body. And yet they hold that the gods whose souls are most blessed are bound to everlasting bodies, the celestials to fiery bodies, and the soul of Jove himself, or this world as they would have us believe, to all the physical elements which compose this entire mass reaching from earth to heaven. 
for this soul plato believes to be extended and diffused by musical numbers from the middle of the inside of the earth which geometricians call the centre outwards through all its parts to the utmost heights and extremities of the heavens so that this world is a very great and blessed immortal animal whose soul has both the perfect blessedness of wisdom and never leaves its own body and whose body has life everlasting from the soul and by no means clogs or hinders it though itself be not a simple body but compacted of so many and so huge materials since therefore they allow so much to their own conjectures why do they refuse to believe that by the divine will and power immortality can be conferred on earthly bodies in which the souls would be neither oppressed with the burden of them nor separated from them by any death but live eternally and blessedly do they not assert that their own gods so live in bodies of fire and that jove himself their king so lives in the physical elements if in order to its blessedness the soul must quit every kind of body let their gods flit from the starry spheres and jupiter from earth to sky or if they cannot do so let them be pronounced miserable but neither alternative will these men adopt for on the one hand they dare not ascribe to their own gods a departure from the body lest they should seem to worship mortals on the other hand they dare not deny their happiness lest they should acknowledge wretches as gods therefore to obtain blessedness we need not quit every kind of body but only the corruptible cumbersome painful dying not such bodies as the goodness of god contrived for the first man but such only as man's sin entailed chapter eighteen but it is necessary they say that the natural weight of earthly bodies either keeps them on earth or draws them to it and therefore they cannot be in heaven our first parents were indeed on earth in a well wooded and fruitful spot which has been named paradise but let our adversaries a little more carefully consider this subject of earthly weight because it has important bearings both on the ascension of the body of christ and also on the resurrection body of the saints if human skill can by some contrivance fabricate vessels that float out of metals which sink as soon as they are placed on the water how much more credible is it that god by some occult mode of operation should even more certainly effect that these earthy masses be emancipated from the downward pressure of their weight this cannot be impossible to that god by whose almighty will according to plato neither things born perish nor things composed dissolve especially since it is much more wonderful that spiritual and bodily essences be conjoined than that bodies be adjusted to other material substances can we not also easily believe that souls being made perfectly blessed should be endowed with the power of moving their earthy but incorruptible bodies as they please with almost spontaneous movement and of placing them where they please with the greatest action if the angels transport whatever terrestrial creatures they please from any place they please and convey them whither they please is it to be believed that they cannot do so without toil and the feeling of burden why then may we not believe that the spirits of the saints made perfect and blessed by divine grace can carry their own bodies where they please and set them where they will for though we have been accustomed to notice in bearing weights that the larger the quantity the greater the weight of earthly bodies is and that the greater the weight the more burdensome it is yet the soul carries the members of its own flesh with less difficulty when they are massive with health than in sickness when they are wasted and though the hale and strong man feels heavier to other men carrying him than the lank and sickly yet the man himself moves and carries his own body with less feeling of burden when he has the greater bulk of vigorous health than when his frame is reduced to a minimum by hunger or disease of such consequence in estimating the weight of earthly bodies even while yet corruptible and mortal is the consideration not of dead weight but of the healthy equilibrium of the parts and what words can tell the difference between what we now call health and future immortality let not the philosophers then think to upset our faith with arguments from the weight of bodies for i don't care to inquire why they cannot believe an earthly body can be in heaven while the whole earth is suspended on nothing for perhaps the world keeps its central place by the same law that attracts to its centre all heavy bodies 
But this I say, if the lesser gods to whom Plato committed the creation of man and the other terrestrial creatures were able, as he affirms, to withdraw from the fire its quality of burning, while they left it that of lighting, so that it should shine through the eyes, and if to the supreme god Plato also concedes the power of preserving from death things that have been born, and of preserving from dissolution things that are composed of parts so different as body and spirit, are we to hesitate to concede to this same god the power to operate on the flesh of him whom he has endowed with immortality, so as to withdraw its corruption but leave its nature, remove its burdensome weight but retain its seemly form and members? But concerning our belief in the resurrection of the dead, and concerning their immortal bodies, we shall speak more at large, God willing, in the end of this work. CHAPTER Nineteen. At present let us go on, as we have begun, to give some explanation regarding the bodies of our first parents. I say, then, that except as the just consequence of sin, they would not have been subjected even to this death which is good to the good, this death which is not exclusively known and believed in by a few, but is known to all, by which soul and body are separated, and by which the body of an animal, which was but now visibly living, is now visibly dead. For though there can be no manner of doubt that the souls of the just and holy dead live in peaceful rest, yet so much better would it be for them to be alive in healthy, well-conditioned bodies, that even those who hold the tenet that it is most blessed to be quit of every kind of body, condemn this opinion in spite of themselves. For no one will dare to set wise men, whether yet to die or already dead, in other words, whether already quit of the body, or shortly to be so, above the immortal gods, to whom the Supreme, in Plato, promises as a munificent gift life indissoluble, or an eternal union with their bodies. But this same Plato thinks that nothing better can happen to men than that they pass through life piously and justly, and being separated from their bodies be received into the bosom of the gods, who never abandon theirs that, oblivious of the past, they may revisit the upper air, and conceive the longing to return again to the body. Virgil is applauded for borrowing this from the Platonic system. Assuredly Plato thinks that the souls of mortals cannot always be in their bodies, but must necessarily be dismissed by death, and, on the other hand, he thinks that without bodies they cannot endure for ever, but with ceaseless alternation pass from life to death, and from death to life. This difference, however, he sets between wise men and the rest, that they are carried after death to the stars, that each man may repose for a while in a star suitable for him, and may thence return to the labors and miseries of mortals, when he has become oblivious of his former misery, and possessed with the desire of being embodied. Those again who have lived foolishly transmigrate into bodies fit for them, whether human or bestial. Thus he has appointed even the good and wise souls to a very hard lot indeed, since they do not receive such bodies as they might always and even immortally inhabit, but such only as they can neither permanently retain nor enjoy eternal purity without. Of this notion of Plato's we have in a former book already said that Porphyry was ashamed in the light of these Christian times, so that he not only emancipated human souls from a destiny in the bodies of beasts, but also contended for the liberation of the souls of the wise from all bodily ties, so that, escaping from all flesh, they might, as bare and blessed souls, dwell with the Father time without end and that he might not seem to be outbid by Christ's promise of life everlasting to his saints, he also established purified souls in endless felicity, without return to their former woes. But, that he might contradict Christ, he denies the resurrection of incorruptible bodies, and maintains that these souls will live eternally, not only without earthly bodies, but without any bodies at all. And yet, whatever he meant by this teaching, he at least did not teach that these souls should offer no religious observance to the gods who dwelt in bodies. And why did he not, unless because he did not believe that the souls, even those separate from the body, were superior to those gods? 
Wherefore, if these philosophers will not dare, as I think they will not, to set human souls above the gods who are most blessed, and yet are tied eternally to their bodies, why do they find that absurd which the Christian faith preaches, namely, that our first parents were so created, that if they had not sinned they would not have been dismissed from their bodies by any death, but would have been endowed with immortality as the reward of their obedience, and would have lived eternally with their bodies, and further, that the saints will in the resurrection inhabit those very bodies in which they have here toiled, but in such sort, that neither shall any corruption or unwieldiness be suffered to attach to their flesh, nor any grief or trouble to cloud their felicity. CHAPTER Twenty. Thus the souls of departed saints are not affected by the death which dismisses them from their bodies, because their flesh rests in hope, no matter what indignities it receives after sensation is gone. For they do not desire that their bodies be forgotten, as Plato thinks fit, but rather because they remember what has been promised by him who deceives no man, and who gave them security for the safe keeping even of the hairs of their head, they with a longing patience wait in hope of the resurrection of their bodies, in which they have suffered many hardships, and are now to suffer never again. For if they did not hate their own flesh, when it, with its native infirmity, opposed their will, and had to be constrained by the spiritual law, how much more shall they love it, when it shall even itself have become spiritual? For as, when the spirit serves the flesh, it is fitly called carnal, so, when the flesh serves the spirit, it will justly be called spiritual. Not that it is converted into spirit, as some fancy from the words, It is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption, but because it is subject to the spirit with a perfect and marvellous readiness of obedience, and responds in all things to the will that has entered on immortality, all reluctance, all corruption, and all slowness being removed. For the body will not only be better than it was here in its best estate of health, but it will surpass the bodies of our first parents ere they sinned. For though they were not to die unless they should sin, yet they used food as men do now, their bodies not being as yet spiritual, but animal only. And though they decayed not with years, nor drew nearer to death, a condition secured to them in God's marvellous grace by the tree of life, which grew along with the forbidden tree in the midst of paradise, yet they took other nourishment, though not of that one tree which was interdicted, not because it was itself bad, but for the sake of commending a pure and simple obedience, which is the great virtue of the rational creature set under the Creator as his Lord. For though no evil thing was touched, yet if a thing forbidden was touched, the very disobedience was sin. They were then nourished by other fruit, which they took that their animal bodies might not suffer the discomfort of hunger or thirst, but they tasted the tree of life that death might not steal upon them from any quarter, and that they might not, spent with age, decay. Other fruits were, so to speak, their nourishment, but this their sacrament, so that the tree of life would seem to have been in the terrestrial paradise what the wisdom of God is in the spiritual, of which it is written, she is a tree of life to them that lay hold upon her. Chapter 21 On this account some allegorize all that concerns paradise itself, where the first men, the parents of the human race, are, according to the truth of holy scripture, recorded to have been. And they understand all its trees and fruit-bearing plants as virtues and habits of life, as if they had no existence in the external world, but were only so spoken of or related for the sake of spiritual meanings. As if there could not be a real terrestrial paradise. As if there never existed these two women, Sarah and Hagar, nor the two sons who were born to Abraham, the one of the bondwoman, the other of the free, because the apostle says that in them the two covenants were prefigured. Or as if water never flowed from the rock when Moses struck it, because therein Christ can be seen in a figure, as the same apostle says, Now that rock was Christ. No one then denies that paradise may signify the life of the blessed, its four rivers, the four virtues, prudence, fortitude, temperance, and justice, its trees, all useful knowledge, its fruits, the customs of the godly, its tree of life, wisdom herself, the mother of all good, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the experience of a broken commandment. The punishment which God appointed was in itself a just and therefore a good thing, but man's experience of it is not good. 
These things can also, and more profitably, be understood of the church, so that they become prophetic foreshadowings of things to come. Thus paradise is the church, as it is called in the canticles, the four rivers of paradise are the four gospels, the fruit trees the saints, and the fruit their works, the tree of life is the holy of holies, Christ, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the will's free choice. For if man despise the will of God, he can only destroy himself, and so he learns the difference between consecrating himself to the common good and reveling in his own. For he who loves himself is abandoned to himself, in order that being overwhelmed with fears and sorrows, he may cry, if there be yet soul in him to feel his ills, in the words of the psalm, My soul is cast down within me, and when chastened may say, Because of his strength I will wait upon thee. These and similar allegorical interpretations may be suitably put upon paradise without giving offence to any one, while yet we believe the strict truth of the history confirmed by its circumstantial narrative of facts. End of Book Thirteen, Chapters Twelve through Twenty One. Recording by Darren L. Slider, Fort Worth, Texas. www.logoslibrary.org.